So to start, my name is Liz Kennedy. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. Uh, I am communications director for Led to Life. Uh, we are a collective of queer artists um, based in the Bay Area that uh, transform guns and other tools of harm into shovels and other life affirming tools. And then we use those tools to lead tree plantings at sites of violence throughout Turtle Island. Uh, I also come speaking to you as program coordinator for the Allied Media Conference. Uh, so next I would like to introduce our dreamy panelists <laughs> before shit gets juicy. <laughs> Um, I would love to start with you, Corey. Uh, Corey is a formerly incarcerated uh, PhD, doctorate, organizer, all the things uh, coming from the formerly incarcerated convicted people and family movement. Uh, he is the co-founder and healing justice organizer with HALA, which is an acronym for how our lives link all together. Uh, he is also a national organizer with the Education Liberation Project, a research associate, former National Science Foundation awardee, um, doing all the things in these abolitionist streets. So Corey, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Jaden. Uh, Jaden is a recent graduate of New York University where she earned her BA in social and cultural analysis. Uh, she aims in her writing and research um, to commit to radical Black thinkers who have come before her and those participating in current struggles and organizing efforts for liberation. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I would love uh, to introduce Olka, um, who I adore virtually. <laughs> uh, Olka is a Fulani storyteller, poet and nomad, an environmental justice advocate and anti-police brutality activist for nearly a decade. She currently works for the SE Justice Group as their comms manager. Um, and that is a California-based nonprofit that serves women with, with incarcerated loved ones. Um, and she is also the founder of the Black Moon Podcast. So yes, this conversation is, yes, I, I, I really can't wait. So thank you all for your presence. Um, and as, as uh, you know, I just did a little kind of introduction, but if there's anything that y'all would like to say, um, I, you know, I definitely invite you to introduce yourselves in a more deeply way. One thing I like to do on panels is to uh, ask folks to dedicate your presence here today to someone. Um, and I know my, my participation today is definitely dedicated to all of our incarcerated loved ones who are still behind bars fighting for abolition, you know, fighting COVID-19. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with them. So, so my, my presence here today is dedicated to all those fighting from the inside. All right, so let's get into these questions, y'all. <laughs> um, so just to start, I really am curious to know, what does transformative justice mean to you? Uh, we're in a we're in a moment where calls to defund the police is kind of getting lost in this propaganda machine, and you know it's getting co-opted by the movements who who gave us this language. You know, we got President Obama chiming in. Um, it, it's quickly kind of become this kind of hot take in the media. So, as you know, dedicated frontline organizers, I really want to know what does transformative justice mean to y'all, and how do you define that? No, we feeling shy. I can go. <laughs> um, you know, for me, transformative justice has so many different layers and levels. Um, but really one that I that centers for me is harm repair that builds trust, healing, and has interventions that change the conditions in which the perpetration or perpetuation of harm um thrives, right? So not just um justice that is um that that seeks not to perpetrate perpetrate more violence but actually intervenes in the conditions in which that violence and harm thrives so right not just um justice that is when we think about sexual violence right like that is um between perpetrator and victim um but that but also addresses like the deep roots of patriarchy in which sexual violence becomes a thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one piece for me. Absolutely. Yeah, and even just uh, Jaden here hopping onto that, I would say um, I was introduced to transformative justice through 
work as an abolitionist and through thinking um, through abolition and something that's really important to me about TJ is recognizing everyone in their fullness, I would mm -hmm. say. You know, it's really easy under punitive systems to just lock someone up or to exile someone from our community, you know. Um, but I think there's an element of TJ that sees us all as complex people who come from context and from different communities. So uh, yeah, building off of what was just said, I would also say recognizing each of us as a full human being who makes mistakes is something that's important to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nah. nah, thanks, man. Just to add, man, um, I would say like, this is just dope to be having this conversation and to be, you know, on here with, um, what feels like some powerful people and some really important people doing the work um, and being able on barn there too. So just shout out to everybody for bringing us together and giving me a chance to meet and learn from some dope, some dope people in the work that I, that I wasn't connected to. I think um, I come to like, I'm not really steeped in transformative justice. Like, and you know, uh, I'm still coming to it in my journey of growing and learning like how to get back to what I would call like African sacred indigeneity and science about how we show up for each other, how we connect to cosmology and our ancestors. But mm -hmm. my veins come in through the non traditional approach to social and criminal justice, which was like a framework, a praxis, an organizing strategy that developed a lot of crit mm -hmm. curriculum and analysis in the prison systems in the late 60s, um, early 70s, 80s, and 90s. And when I came in prison in the 2000s, I ran into like this kind of like underground pedagogy about analysis, about healing inside about what you know when you come out and i think all of that was like analysis of like what i started to learn later on about what transforming justice is too and then another thing comes in through healing justice and really thinking about Carter page and the southern healing justice collective and a lot of queer and a lot of black women um and, and really thinking about cosmology and the stars and then those mm -hmm. things got me to like you know generation five um um, the youth organizing collective. I mean, I mean, I mean um, the, the, um, the youth justice um, coalition, and 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 their analysis and, and more understanding of like, you know, how this is a, a response to definitely violence, but really understanding the historical, the system. I mean, the community and the individual, and really think about how do we support each other, how do we support each other, how do we respond to violence, support each other. Um, so I can get my light back on. That that relies on that relies on the community, um, mm -hmm. and that that and takes in counter definitely accountability. That definitely takes in counter um, circumstances and conditions, um, and think about safety and really how you grapple. Like kind of like what the panel already said, the context, um, the people, and how do you create a culture um, to hold that over time, and and and, and to hold that space because a lot of stuff come up. When, when we're dealing with that mess. So how do you have a culture that can start holding that? So I say that's some of it, you know, but I, the last thing I would say is too, is that a lot of it is like, um, you know, a lot of this is people doing this in a living room. So like, it's not like a paid thing. When I think about transformative justice, I don't really think about people like, in like, all, like not saying people not connected to organizations, but I see this is like another layer of work that people are doing in living rooms, doing like mm -hmm. the wee hours. So some mm -hmm. of this is like, not like traditionally like, like you got a job description, you're getting paid. This is kind of like women, queer people, people who trans people, people who are living out already outside the margin a little bit too, that are pulling on strategies too. So I just want to uplift that too. Yes, that is so important. And you know, thank you, Corey, for that offering because I think it's really important to ground this conversation in, you know, the history of the transformative justice movement, which was given to us by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. It was given to us by survivors. And you know, the roots of this movement are deeply queer and trans um, and really center the experiences of women of color, specifically black women. So I think that is so important. And um, you know, I think one of the guiding mantras of the transformative justice movement that I come back to so often is we keep us safe, right? Like we cannot rely upon these systems of policing and prisons, which is not just prisons and police, it's it's psychiatric hospitals, it's it's ICE detention centers. You know, we're thinking about the prison industrial complex in much more expanded ways. So we know that these systems don't keep us safe. Um, so transformative justice 
instead of just responding reactively to the harm and the violence that is occurring in our societies, you know, we're asking, well, how can we transform the conditions that create this type of harm and violence in the first place? How do we stop that harm and violence from reproducing? And, you know, I, I think about Angela Davis's quote, like radical is just grasping things by the root, right? And so that's what's so radical about transformative justice to me is like, let's transform the root of this harm the root of this violence. Like I live in Detroit, I'm a Detroiter. And, you know, throughout this pandemic, you know, my people have not had clean water. There's over 10,000 Detroiters to this day who have not had water to cleanse themselves and their family, all the things in a pandemic. And it's like, meanwhile, the, the budget for the Detroit police department um, has almost doubled. So it's like, well, the police doesn't keep us safe, but clean water keeps us safe. We keep each other safe. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really, that really resonates. And um, something that all of y'all kind of touched on is just like, really what I'm hearing is like community support, community resources. Um, so the next question is, you know, what are some transformative justice resources in your community? Um, and can you describe an experience that you've had with community-based responses to harm and violence that don't rely upon the state? I'll take a stab yeah. at this one first. Oh, sorry, Corey. Oh, I was just gonna say real quick, Corey, uh, something that you said made me think of this question. Also, um, when I was reflecting on it, like thinking about how truly I consider like friends and family as resources for transformative justice, to your mm -hmm. point about how this happens in living rooms, it happens uh, with family members, community members, you know, it's not always going to a nonprofit or going to an organization to get mm -hmm. this, this work done. So um, I would say a resource that I look to in my community and even to your your point before about dedicating um, our time here to to other people who aren't here, I would say, I really see my, my close friends um, as like my support system. I would dedicate um, me even being here to them, uh, especially, in being able to imagine transformative justice as a reality, I look at how we hold space for each other and how we take care of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and that's not connected to the state in any way. We actively try to get it as far as we can in the way that we see mm -hmm. each other, in the way that we love each other. And so I would say a transformative justice resource, if we want to call it a resource, um, which I think it is that I see is is really my my group of amazing, wonderful black women friends. So yeah, yes. are out there. Yeah, I could jump in off that, man. I think um, I'm gonna zone in and zone out on this a couple of things. So I think like thinking about like just growing up like by my mom who's from Mississippi, who also from Chicago, who also from New York, who also impacted by the drug epidemic. There's just like a lot of stuff in our family like that just can't go outside, you know? So I think that's like one thing to think about, like how do we negotiate stuff without like letting people know, how do we do that? All of the stuff we do ain't the best practice, but I'm just saying that's like, when I look back at it, I seen us doing certain things and then growing up on the block and in street life and in hallways and in corners and prison cells, a lot of our, in prisons, a lot of our interactions work outside of the state. And also a lot of that is also mm -hmm. hurting stuff in the community too, you know, but a lot of that gives you a, a spirit about an, an, an imagination that like, oh, I could live every day outside of this. This could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then when I think about um, Hala and like some of our many experiences over the last five years, like uh, we had had stuff where people don't physically have fights with each other inside of our own team. Um, we don't have stuff across gender lines um, across mm -hmm. identities between gender, between dudes, between sisters. Um, and all of those things, you know, like, and that's nothing about transform justice. Like, I don't know if we was perfect in all of those things. Cause I think it was a lot of failure. It was a lot of things we was doing, mm -hmm. struggling and trying and trying to hold space. Um, but, um, it also felt like moments of like circles, like the circles felt hard. Like it didn't work at that moment. But when you think about it th three months later, you're like, oh, we needed that though. You know, mm -hmm. but in the moment, it probably didn't feel like it was good. You know, it didn't feel like we was holding it, you know. Um, and then sometimes we didn't have circles or we missed the moment and like we didn't really like address something um, as a team. And like we found out later, like, damn, that's something we like probably could have dated better as we learned later on. 
but just to make it a little more concrete to talk about one particular moment um two of our young people um two two nobody brothers um got it's like a fist fight um and um in front of everybody during session during our political education session during like i ain't reading like over reading and, and stuff just got, got got crazy um and you know one of the things we did was you know we broke it up we all shot in from different places because it was just the young people in the space pretty much and all some of the elder people shot in we negotiated it got calmed down a little bit uh people walked away we circled up and we decided three hours later to have like an initial circle with all of our people that was there our community and we just talked about it but people who was fighting they didn't want to really go it was like what you mean circle man i just got like like i ain't with that but we we talked and we asked and we all had a circle um so that was like one instant of it um that was hard um we started to say you know some cases we could have been like yo they out the program you know like they they mm -hmm. fought in the program like they they in, they in, they endangered a lot of the other young people who are trying to help, who are trying to do stuff like they making it you know um but we feel like you know we wanted to like keep our community strong and also love and have accountability so we created a process where we already knew some person who was formerly incarcerated who did a lot of work intervening with gun violence and she identified stuff he was cool with all of our young people and part of our legacy we connected him to one of the young people. I went with one of the young people. We told them that we were give them a two week process where they away from the program, just working on their own stuff. They still got paid. They still got all of the stuff that they was getting. We was doing one-on-one -on -one counseling or building it with them. Mm. Um, the other young people in the program started doing other work and to keep the board going and doing other stuff to take care of themselves. We came back two weeks later. I mean, during that process, we also hired another person who was like a friend, but we also hired them um, to do circles with the two young people that was in fight and reflected on the incident. And that was hard. They had to reflect back what each other was saying to each other. Um, so all of that was like some of the process in the two weeks and a lot of hours of strategizing even to come up with that plan, you know, to even think about what we were gonna do. And then when we came back, they didn't fight again, but it was perfect. We had other times let's circle it up again, you know. But that's just some of what I would say of like that feels like we leaning on like our brother K. We leaning on like the um the sisters um who do deep healing circle with our with our organization and was doing cultural with our organization to infuse healing in our organization. So we leaned on them in that moment to come in because they already knew our young people to do some one on one circles with them with our elders. So all of our relationships, you know, and then like our wives you know, our friends at home, cause we was on the phone to two in the morning, three in the morning. Like we didn't leave, we didn't leave work that night. So our families had to like, understand that, that we was just trying to figure stuff out. So, you know, I think back to, to the point earlier, like you need your family cause you, your family can also feel that energy. Like, yo, you've been gone all day and now you come at home and you're doing X, Y, and Z. And definitely when you got children and you got like, you, you know, you got, you got a partnership who are taking up a lot of responsibility. Like they mm -hmm. want you to hold some of that down too. So I think just, getting our family and understanding all this and also journeying and, and knowing like how that's transformed with the two and your families open up space for you to love community in a certain way that got to be in our fold of what we think about is transformative too yes corey that was a whole word okay and you set us up perfectly for this next question <laughs> um yeah, I, I'm really hearing all of y'all touching on how, you know, transformative justice is absolutely a collective framework. Like it cannot exist without your family, your friends, your partnerships. Um, that's really the core of it. You know, that's that's the core of us keeping us safe. Um, so the next question um, is really just about, you know, what are your daily commitments to transformative justice? Like, you know, we know that it teaches us that punishment isn't safety, right? Um, accountability is safety. Um, wellness is safety. Um, so how have you unlearned punishment and punitive responses to harm? You know, Corey, I'm hearing you tell the story about um, how, you know, y'all had to resist disposability of that young brother who was acting up, you know, who was endangering others, you know, a punitive response would just be like, we can't do it he's a threat, he's out. That's not a transformative justice framework. Nobody is disposable. So what are your daily commitments to abolishing that cop in your head? <laughs> I love this question because my answer is always, I haven't unlearned it. I'm actually in the process of unlearning, right? <laughs> it's an ever, ever going process because it was a whole 
time of socialization into this. But I know myself, you know, just things like communicating instead of assuming, including and especially when things are hard, um, leaving space to be wrong, which like a hard one, um, refusing to engage or speak with police period, mm. just no matter what's going on, y'all not the ones to help me. And I know that from experience and I know that from the experience of my people. Um, and then like really coming up, like just kind of constantly, I think what Corey was talking about, like experimenting, coming up with strategies of how to unlearn it, right? Um, and I did wanna um, actually like give a few resources of transformative justice in my community. First of all, I wanna shout out Led to Life, period. <laughs> Um, you know, doing that work of transformation of harm via ceremony and public witnessing. Mm. Um, I have been in Oakland, Ohlone lands here for a little bit more than a year. And literally the most transformative ceremony I have been to was held by Led to Life, um, honoring mothers who had lo lost their children to um, violence, gun violence. Mm. And so, you know, that's one place, uh, critical resistance. They yes. provide so much information and knowledge on abolition and transformative justice. Um, you know, and I, th I wanna shout out also my organization, SE Justice Group, right? Because an injustice has happened to women with incarcerated loved ones. Y'all are just talking about all these women who hold you down, often black women, often women of color. And those women have been isolated, they've been invisibilized, and they are doing work on our behalf, on our community's behalf for free, like most of the time for free. And so having an organization or having groups where we come together and break political isolation, um, say that we will not be invisible, that we're also survivors, ongoing survivors of this carceral system, and that the impacts of incarceration police violence, surveillance go beyond, right? Like those bars, they go outside and um, into our communities. So, yeah. I think that's real f for me too, man, learning that like it's hard to like get the cop out your head um, and like transformation is hard work and 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 also growing to, to be gentle with myself, like be hard on myself, but you be gentle on myself. Because like his like I, we we got a documentary out right now called We Came to Hill on YouTube. It's one part of the documentary where I say like like trying to make sense of historical trauma and contemporary oppression and interpersonal dynamics is a lot. Mm -hmm. And you be thinking you got it, and then like the next day you oh shit I don't got it. <laughs> I thought I had it, and sometimes like even when we musa and doing rituals and reading and and stuff certain things in the world trigger us that we thought we probably hadn't hit us and we respond in some of that that punishment or you know i think i think about language like how i think about other people and i name them and i call them like oh you homeless and how i i, I used to call people homeless and the b word i still like sometimes see that in people even if i don't say it it's my spirit i'm like oh you feel that you know like like all of that is some of the stuff that like you know it takes a time to first notice in us because sometimes we just moving in the we are present we don't even notice it i think that's a lot of work to even get to a place to start noticing it and then when you start noticing sometimes we be hard i'd be hard on myself you know i'd be like oh like and i can't even like when i when i fail or when i'm like acting like a cop or it's in my head or i, or I like i'm not living out to my best self all the time sometimes i stay stuck there and i can't get back to tomorrow i can't like you know, so I think learning how to like keep growing, keep struggling, love myself and, and put myself in situations and dynamics where people can love me and give me feedback, but also like use my, you know, understand it's a lot to catch up with, you know, and, and, and it's a lot to learn and, and when, and, and use failure as a way to say, you know, like, I'm going I'm to try to be better tomorrow and like, know that's in my heart, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think that's the real thing that like, what I'm learning about, you know, but but the, the other thing I would say is that like it's work though too, you know, because you got to think about language. You need to think about like you know all of the identity politics. You need to think about history. You need to think about circumstances. So I do think when there's some whatever basics kind of like that we all need to be thinking about when we're trying to unlearn the cop. You know, like 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 you got to like get outside yourself a little bit. You got to get into history. You got to understand indigenous. You got to understand. You got to understand like ancestors. You know, you really got to go back to ancestors because like we started when we had colonization and enslavement, we lost a lot of cosmology, we lost a lot of culture. 
and part of like transformative justice or abolition is trying to get back to our culture, get get back mm -hmm. to some of that wisdom. But you also got to be careful with yourself because family been teaching you stuff, community been teaching you stuff, and like how you make sense of all of that, you know, um, as you abolishing the cop in you, um, where you don't like stop loving yourself, which is also your family and community as well, and yourself too, it's really important. Mm, that was so beautiful. Um, my internet cut out for a little part of that. Sorry, y'all, but I trust that it was all the things. Um, I love that you brought up critical resistance, Olka, because uh, Andrea Ritchie, who has given us so much of this language, um, she she talks about abolitious, <laughs> and I feel like this conversation is just all the abolitionists. So, um, yeah, and I, you know, to go off of what you just offered, Corey, um, you know, I, I'm hearing you bring up a lot of healing justice. I'm hearing how you you really talk about how we need to decolonize our relationships to justice and to responding to harm and how much of that is actually really deeply spiritual work and how much of that is getting back to our um, pre-slavery, you know, pre-colonization roots. Like how did our ancestors respond to harm? You know, they didn't rely on no police they didn't have no prisons. Um, so, you know, transformative justice is actually really about decolonizing so much of our relationships to justice and harm. So um, the, my next question is, you know, what can ritual and ceremony offer our movements for transformative justice and abolition? Um, Olga, you brought up led to life's work. You know, we, we really do believe that ceremony is an ancestral technology that we have that's been passed down to us for how we can respond to this. And um, there's this language that I heard on a, it was a disability justice and abolition panel um, that happened a couple weeks ago. And one of the panelists said, you know, abolition is just replacing a gun with an ecosystem. Ooh. And I love that. That, mm. that language has just given me, this, it, it's just given me so much because that, that to me is at the root of led to life's work. It's at the root of so much of my work. Like, we are replacing a gun with a whole ecosystem, a friend group, your partnerships, your neighbors, right? Like folks are always like, oh, TJ, how does it work? It works every time you trust your neighbors more than you trust the police, period. Like mm. that is transformative mm. justice. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm really, I'm really wondering mm. like, you know, what, what can ritual and ceremony and healing justice and African spirituality, like what can this offer our movements right now? You know, our sacred indigenous peers and friends remind us that ceremony and prayer are the reason that they survived genocide. And mm. that is important. Um, you know, it is ritual and ceremony allow us to make collective commitments to one another and to our new vision. Well, really our old vision as we're talking about. And that ceremony and ritual makes it so that what is sacred isn't sellable, right? Because the reason mm -hmm. that so many of these systems continue to thrive and continue to, you know, like from police who are budget hoarders to prosecutors who make their names to judges who are some of the wealthiest people in our society, the carceral mm -hmm. state is a creator of wealth and profit, right? And it does so by perpetuating the capture, control, and trade of human bodies. Mm -hmm. And that is because they have decided that human bodies are not sacred from the jump, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that ceremony and ritual and prayer reinvigorates and, and reestablishes and says, this is sacred. This land mm -hmm. is sacred. These people are sacred. Yeah. That they must be treated a certain way. There is no price, no matter what, right? I think that's what, what ritual and ceremony give us. Mm. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I think um, ritual, ceremony, you know, healing justice was also brought up. A big thing for me has been, I mean, I'm 22 now. I found abolition or I was introduced to abolition when I was 20, 19. Um, and the big thing about healing justice and abolition is that we all deserve to heal. I think that that's something that you're not necessarily taught off the bat or you unlearn as you get older. Um, but ritual, ceremony, healing justice, these kinds of things really bring that to the forefront for me is that, you know, our communities deserve the abundance that they have. We deserve to be abundantly connected to each other. Like those kinds of things that yes. get really lost and, and pressed down in, in the punitive systems that we have right now, I think 
ceremony and ritual are ways to reconnect like what y'all were saying to that older sort of logic and understanding of who we are and who we are in connection to other people. So I do think that that's like a way to remind ourselves, especially when it comes to, I was so glad somebody said that they have not unlearned the cop uh, in their head. Cause I read that question. I was like, oh, I don't know if I have, I have, I don't know if I have period. Um, I don't know if, if it's gonna be a lifelong kind of thing, but yeah, that ritualistic return and celebration. I think that there's something there that really draws you in um, to what TJ's all about for sure. Mm. Yes, absolutely. We're all, it's an emergent journey. You know, I, so much of what I've learned about this movement comes from Mariam Kaba and Shira Hassan. And uh, I really want to put out a resource. Um, their workbook, Fumbling Towards Repair, is a great start for anyone who's interested in this work. And it's called Fumbling Towards Repair for a reason. Like, <laughs> it's going to have to take all of us. It's going to take every possible strategy until we get it right. And shit is not pretty all the time, right? Like, you know, it's not easy to practice disposability in a hyper-capitalist um, carceral state in which we are rewarded for practicing disposability. And, you know, it's so special to me that we get to have this conversation with four people of African descent, four people who are survivors of, you know, transatlantic slavery, you know, our ancestors survived that. And, you know, four people who come from communities who are, you know, really at the forefront and most impacted by these systems. Um, so it's just it's really special to, to hold space with with other black folks and to have this conversation rooted in in black liberation. It feels really important. Um, so, yeah, Corey, I would love to hear from you on this as well. Um, and, you know, you have brought up healing justice um, a few times. So I was wondering for the audience who may not be familiar, can you just describe what healing justice is and, and what that means to you, especially in relationship to transformative justice? Now, that's dope, man. I think. Um... As I said, I've been learning about healing justice really from Cara Page, from Sean Genwright, from my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in Oakland, um, Courage, um, and 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 also from Hala Youth Organizing Collective the last five years doing our own kind of thread of that. And I think part of like the analysis is really saying that like forever, like all of our like families and communities have always had healing and organizing and community building together. And that like, when we organize and we're not just power mapping and like figuring out how we get power in a sense that's not also considering like how we think about self-determination related to wellness, related to healing, the relationships between each other and within families and within like ourselves, whether that's skill development or analysis. I think another part of it is saying that like, yeah, like as we heal ourselves, um, and heal our communities, like, you know, which embody a lot of patriarchy, which embody a lot of like class division, which embody a lot of the stuff that is out in the historical and, and structural ether. If we do the healing work on ourselves, we are, we're, we're doing some of that outer historical work as well. Um, those things are part of the process. It's also saying going back to um, ancestors and cosmology that like technologies of wellness. Um, of, of like how elements of fire, water, earth, mineral, and nature, and like the teachings and the learnings that come from those vibrations, whether it's like the creation of the drum, the creation of like pyramids mm -hmm. and temples or architecture, the creation mm -hmm. of like medical medicine, like all of these elements have long taught us um, a vibration to be in conversation with the universe and with the spirits within the things that's on the universe. And and part of healing justice is, is trying to remember that technology and go back to that technology mm -hmm. and send that technology. Yes. And I think um yeah, I think um yeah, man, I think I think it was already said, man, rituals like trying to like make it sacred, man. The only thing I would add to that is that I'm at my altar right now. And, um, you know, I got a stick for my daughter, Star, who passed away at 40 days. I got a lot of my grandmoms and my aunties here. Um, but I think there's rituals at different levels. It's like personal, individual rituals that to re-energize you and bring a coach and a vibration within you. 
that you need to, to have when you go outside or when you go kick it with your wife and you go kick it with your son, you go kick it with your organization, when you go kick it with your sisters, because they might come in with some shit that you ain't ready for. Like, oh shit, mm -hmm. they might be trying like so you gotta you gotta be doing you and you gotta be instilling hope in you, not just like getting ready for the war outside, but where your hope coming from. And then you mm -hmm. gotta do rituals with your sisters, with your bros, with your with your intersectional families, with your mom. Like that need a space too. Then we need spaces to bring all of those sections together because we're trying to create the vibration to hold us. So, you know, rituals, I think, all is about, like, how do we get the sacred in all of those levels? You know, and it's a fight when we're dealing with historical contemporary system reality and ourselves, too. Like, you know, do we trust ourselves? You know, because mm -hmm. a lot of times my family be like, yo, why you at the altar, why you at the altar so much? You know what I'm saying? Like, it took me so long to even get to the altar. And when they tell me, like, that, that, that spirit in me is like, bird, why you here? Like, but I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm gonna be on a panel with these dope people here. They might be, they, they do all, like, but then it's, it's a lot of like, people I love. Like, I don't know why you do that. What you do with that's real wisdom in your spirit, you know? You gotta negotiate mm. that. Mm, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm on, I live in Detroit. I'm in Central Florida. I definitely packed an altar to go. Like, <laughs> you got to, you got to. <laughs> Just with this whole move. Come on now, don't pull yourself. <laughs> My ancestors stay fed. Um, and I, I think about that often, like how so much of my transformative justice, I've learned so much. I've learned so much on my yoga mat. I've learned so much like in nature. I've learned so much just sitting at my altar and humbling myself. Like so much of that abolishing the cop in your head, you know, that none of us have done, but all of us are working towards. Like that's where that happens in those really interior moments for me as well. And I mean, damn, we wouldn't have so many Karens calling the cops on the culture if more white folks were connected to their spiritual practices and more white folks were committed mm, to colonizing mm. their spiritual practices like we like that that should that is a part of transformative justice absolutely um if you are Definitely. a white woman watching this please don't get offended by the terms karen <laughs> um stop calling the cops on the culture <laughs> Um, next, I would really love to talk about environmental and climate justice because, you know, we are here with the Bioneers Conference. Um, I know, Olka, you are a committed environmental justice advocate. I come from ECJ Spaces. Um, and we know that we can't really talk about transformative justice without also talking about climate justice and environmental racism and all the things. Um, you know, it's no accident that the communities most violated by the prison industrial complex are the communities most affected by environmental racism and by climate injustice. Um, so I think about um, organizations like campaigns to fight toxic prisons that advocate for protecting incarcerated people at risk of dangerous environmental conditions. Um, and they also uh, advocate for restoring surrounding communities and ecosystems impacted by the construct construction and operation of prisons. So there's all these different organizations kind of working at those intersections. Like my work with Led to Life, you know, we very much see state violence and environmental violence in, in hand. And we know that we cannot we can't just plant trees um, without talking about police brutality. Like we can't just work alongside predominantly black communities that are on the front line of experiencing state violence without also talking about um, asthma in, in the East Bay. And without also talking about all the many, many ways that environmental racism is impacting these communities. Um, so yeah, I'm really curious, what other intersections do y'all see between state violence and environmental violence? And why should every, environmentalists be an abolitionist. <laughs> okay, y'all, y'all know I'm about to go off on this one. So, <laughs> um, you know, okay. So one thing just uh, at Allied Media Conference this year, Bronte Velez, who's also a part of Led to Life um, said, if you're willing to hurt black people, you're willing to hurt the land. Um, mm -hmm. you hurt the land you, you've hurt black people. And that is just, that's that's like the entirety of the thing, right? Um, you know, I always point out to examples like San Quentin Prison um, is literally across from the Chevron refinery and the chemical plants that are right there. That is no accident. Um, the Superfund site here in Oakland that has been here since 1995 and the EPA just started addressing in 2017 is in West Oakland. It's not in the Oakland Hills. It's in West Oakland. Who is in West Oakland? Right. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I have been to uh, Cancer Alley in Louisiana, mm -hmm. There's more than one, but um, where the petrochemical plants are literally in view of old slave plantations. Like none of that is actually completely inextricable from one another. Every single place there is a site of environmental damage and violence right nearby, there are going to be black or there are going to be indigenous people. Those things are like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it's, for me, it's actually a literal physical manifestation, right? There is kind of like the, the, um, intellectual understanding of it too, but like in literal physical space, that is the truth of environmental damage. Yeah. Mm. And I think even you offering that made me think, uh, Rikers, I, I'm, I went to school mm -hmm. in New York, um, raised in New Jersey. Um, Rikers is a repurposed landfill. So that idea that the two are literally linked, even if um, there's this push to make it an intellectual thing, even if you just look at it, um, is really true. I also, in thinking about this, I um, thinking about the way that, I guess, a lot of the times the way that environmental issues are discussed, um, especially in spaces where they aren't immediately felt, it's kind of this thing where it's like, oh, in 50 years or 100 years, we'll have to deal with it. Um, and if it's not immediately felt, it's easy to push off, I think. Whereas similarly, like the violence is of the state, if it's not immediately in your face for a lot of people, people want to push it off or pretend it's not that bad or you know, mm -hmm. the over there in that country, X, Y, Z, other things. So um, I think they're in linking the two um, would do a lot of work for a lot of people, I think, in realizing that not only are they literally linked, like they are, you can look out your window and see the connections, um, but the way that we think about these problems are often very similar. So bridging that gap of understanding, you know, like even if it's not immediately in front of you, it's happening and it's happening rapidly for, you know, even just two towns over. So um, yeah, I think there's there's so much work to be done. And once you already see those connections, it, it really changes it for you. Mm. Absolutely. And just to add, man, I think, yeah, not nah, snaps. And just to add, I think, I think, um, yeah, man, I just think ancestor wise, I think thinking about like, enslavement and colonization like which i think is at the some of the early stories stories of mass incarceration or prison that complex the journey of like the social control formation and it was always about snatching people land and mm -hmm. um and snatching people environment and these things it's not just like snatching people land and environment i answer them. i think when we think about cosmology like the, the, the like and definitely thinking about black people and, and, and native people and like their connection to like being river people and being close to water and mm. like understanding how that and certain in certain relatives whether those be animals or certain plants and how those things have um life or death responsibilities to how people practice ritual and ceremony but also how people build their houses and their structures how people eat um mm. and how so when you move people from those things that like have a lot of generations of knowledge in it and, and, and ask people to like, for, for one, like, get, like like figure that out somewhere else, that's already genocide, that's already death, you know? Yes. And then as yeah. we keep moving in that con that continuum and we get into like, you know, like, yeah, like, like, um, yeah, like, you know, post-Civil War and Great Migration trying to figure it out, we always been in environmental, like social toxins, whether that's been in our schools and our neighborhoods, like they always, have had social toxins, whether that's been like lead paint, um, poor poor structures that slowly killed us, whether that's mm -hmm. like food in our neighborhood that they done took from any of our indigenous lands and put them in stores that we gotta buy, but they give us the worst of it that comes. All of these things are a, a contextual historical journey of like the, the environment and how like us, and then the last thing I say is like us being away from that knowledge like there's a lot of hurt when you like don't know what you should know or don't know like your relationship to like fruits and food and and environment um because you've been so along down the line and relationships and stories haven't got to you and context gets to you and yeah so you yeah i think that's another hurt when 
you know, a lot of our young people, including myself at one time, are scared to go to nature. You know, a lot of things that I that 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 like that, that come from the land, we don't think taste good or we don't like to eat. You know, um, we're, we're we're hyper sensitive into like artificial foods and art and fake sugars. Like all of that is like a because your body is an environment too. Like your body is your best healing vessel. Like what yes. you put in your body is part of like the best environment of the universe. And like like we would like like go crazy from like eating sugar or something like us like we've been so hurt that we think that's what our body needs and that's like deep too mm, mm, i love that framing of yes what like what is our environment like our bodies are sites of environmental justice in the same way that they are sites of safe violence. and you know i want to yeah i i, I want to bring in the the teachings of cat brooks um who's co-founder of the anti-police terror project in oakland and one of the things that she always says is all violence is state violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is so real. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate how all of y'all are really thinking about like the physicality of state violence and environmental violence. Um, you know, Rikers and just the proximity of prisons and police stations to super fun sites, like all of that is so real. So we're, we, uh, we're gonna move on to our last question, but for folks who wanna get more involved with this work, um, I really encourage y'all to check out the campaign to fight toxic prisons. Um, they work a lot with incarcerated people. Um, I really would also recommend the Prison Ecology Project. Like these, these, are, these are really interconnected fights. Um, so if you came here for environmental conservation or justice, I hope that you also leave with an understanding of how linked this is to transformative justice. You know, we we, we, we simply, like if, if transformative justice is, is about transforming the, the roots, transforming the conditions that allow for violence and harm to be reproduced, environmental violence like has to be one of the first starting places we do that because all of the soil on Turtle Island is traumatized. Like there is deep trauma in this soil from indigenous genocide, from African enslavement, from the extraction of our natural resources, deforestation, all of the habitat loss, all of the harm that our more than human kin are facing. Um, and that's a symptom of state violence. Uh, so yes, I am going to move on to our last question uh, before we hop into um, a call to action from our amazing panelists and then finally a Q and A. Uh, so uh, our last question today is um, really getting at what kind of brought us here today is uh, just what this movement can offer us in thinking about, you know, intergenerational coalition building and um, knowledge sharing. So uh, this movement for abolition, for transformative justice has always been you know, deeply intergenerational and intersectional. You know, we've, we've brought up the names of so many incredible people today from Miriam Kama, Andrea Ritchie, you know, we have like OGs in the movement. And then we have people um, like you, Jaden, that were like learning about this when you were 19 and are like on the winning team. Like we love to see it. <laughs> um, you know, my collective with with Blood to Life, like we're all 20 somethings trying to trying to find a new path, like trying to find a new way. Um, so my question to y'all um, to conclude this panel is just what wisdom can you offer youth looking to get involved with transformative justice work? And what wisdom can you offer our elders and older folks who are even more socialized in these systems of harm and violence than we are? Um, yeah, what can we offer those who, who, who are on the fence, who wanna get involved, um, but maybe aren't ready to dive right in? I would say, um, yeah, I think um, it's hard to say it, man, but I think it takes a lot, of, but I think we just need more confidence between our young people and our other people to like create space with each other. But I think, mm -hmm. um, and we need more facilitators, more people. We need to like be more intentional about that and not like just space to be with each other, but to share struggles and share, like have those spaces be about sharing stories and struggles. And us at Holla, we've been fortunate to like grow up in prison and know some of the people and a lot of the people that was a part of the 60s and 70s and 80s was building this stuff. So when we talked to our sisters that was in Bedford Hill and Kathy Boudin and Donna Hilton and Judith Clark and um and, and Cheryl White, that we talked to our brothers, like and then our young people who are coming up under Holla and coming up as they own, they could see all of those relationships and they could kick it with them. Like that's one of the things I have like material ancestors and elders 
in in the framework in the space of interaction i think it's really really important and how do you get enough relationships and enough space that makes some of those ties together because you need to have a space to hold that and that, that has some of that connection the other thing i would say is that um we got an album out um and you know for young people and particularly young dudes but just even young people who are queer and documented and who've been through a lot of violence sometimes it's hard to share your truth to share mm-hmm. your pain um mm-hmm. and thinking about like african sacred science thinking about ancestors thinking about the drum and how negro spirituals and the drum has always been mm-hmm. part of like culture and, yes. and information and vibration and wellness mm-hmm. um we made an album and a lot of our young people were sharing deep stories about themselves in hip hop through R&B. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's like another way that young people could think about who are already dropping bars and already just got urban swag that like you can, you could turn some of that urban swag into wisdom, not only to get your story out, but like you can make an album like we did and it can help other young people probably get their story out too. Um, so I think um, like tapping into poetry, tapping into music, tapping into artistic expression and trusting those spaces you create within yourself. And then if you got fortunate enough to have like a family or a community that do music with trusting those spaces as well. And then the last thing is if you got enough confidence sharing it with other people, cause people like benefit from, you know, all of our journeys, you know, that's where the hope is that when yes. we see each other. Mm, yes, that was beautiful. Thank you. My um, contribution to this, um, as far as resources, is to encourage people to break their political isolation um, Mm -hmm. by joining an organized body of people, right? Like, I'm a former digital organizer. I'm a communications manager. You will never catch me saying that, like, internet activism isn't meaningful, but Mm -hmm. I think you got to take it beyond that, right? Like, Um, At Essie, we started a little Black feminist book club. So we've read a couple books. One of them was um, about the Kambahi River Collective, um, who really began this idea of intersectional politics. And I thought I knew what identity politics was off being on Twitter. And then I read this book. I was like, oh, I did not know what I was talking about. (laughs) Who created this? That's not what they meant. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was really important. And so, you know, just taking it a little bit further than kind of that bite-sized information that social media can provide, I think is really important. Um, Contributing in your way, right? Like not the way you think you should or whatever, but like Mm -hmm. your way showing up in your authentic integrity, that is actually what we need. We need every single different person. Like Corey was saying, like the musicians and artists and, you know, if that's the way you contribute, like that is actually what we need. And then the last thing that I want to say is that like Mm -hmm. what I have learned, especially, um, you know, just recently is like the world isn't changed by individuals. It's changed by collectives. Um, just join a collect, get some other folks. Listen, y'all, when I tell you right now, I have an obsession with Joanne Robinson and I'm about to tell her story because people don't know that Joanne Robinson was in the background that we would not know who Rosa Parks was or Martin Luther King Jr. if it wasn't for the work yep. of Joanne Robinson. And mm-hmm. she was just like, I'm back here part of a collective. I'm not trying to be in y'all faces, right? Mm-hmm. And And so just also decolonizing that giving all credit to individuals and really giving it to groups and collectives and centering that even in your experience Mm. all day all day yeah Mm. damn that is so real that is so real yeah i mean it really does take all of us like we can't keep us safe unless it's all of us and it's a collective commitment and you know, I think that's one of the things that makes people nervous about this current movement for racial justice. You know, all of the defund the police cries, you know, the transformative justice movement, the prison abolition movement. It's intentionally decentralized. Mm-hmm. You know, it is very much grassroots. And we want it that way. Like, that is what keeps our movement strong. Um, I share a birthday with Ella Baker. Um, it's sad season, you already know. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was... That, right. Like that. I mean, that was one of her gifts to us. Like, you know, she was a Titan, same as Joanne of the civil rights movements and the movements for transformative justice and abolition of the past. And was like, nah, like strong people don't need strong leaders. Like that's, that to me embodies the mantra of we keep us safe. Um, you know, we don't need police. We don't need prisons. We don't need the nonprofit industrial complex. 
we need our neighbors, we need our friends, we need our families. Um, so yes, uh, please uh, finish us off, Dayton. Um, what do you have? What wisdom do you have to offer? I honestly, I'm sitting here like clapping. <laughs> Y'all are saying everything that I was thinking, and it's. I will say, and I mean, I don't know if wisdom is the word I would use, but advice maybe. Um, I don't know, it's not easy. I would say, like folks were saying, reject the idea that you need to be the loudest, the biggest, the best, X, Y, and Z. All of those things are myths um, that have been fed. So I would say start where you feel comfortable and start with who you have around you. And if you don't have anyone around you, you can look to sort of spaces, like you said, for political education. Um, that was a big thing for me was just reading. I read uh, Blood in My Eye for in one day and it was just by George Jackson and it was just, um, yeah. you know, like starting somewhere as opposed to nowhere and feeling like you don't have to be perfect mm. off the bat has been a big thing. Cause I think we're kind of taught, like if you're gonna say like, oh, I'm an abolitionist, you have to know everything off the top of your head and you have to be able to cite all these sorts of things, but that's not true. Um, you've been practicing abolition in ways that you don't even know. You've been practicing transformative justice in ways you don't even know. So um, you're already probably in the movement in ways that you don't even know. So I would say starting somewhere as opposed to nowhere, um, rejecting perfectionism is a huge thing and being kind to yourself um, yeah, and taking the time that it takes because it's not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy, but it's happening now. So I would say, yeah, that's some wisdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. that that was definitely so I would also say to older folks, because I know that was another, another thing. Um, I found that, you know, younger generation, older generation, like we all live on this earth to bring it back mm -hmm. to environmental justice and to bring it back to thinking, you know, I have things in common through conversation that I didn't think I was gonna have in common with older people. Um, and it's really, like you said, Corey, about making the space for us to, to come together um, and to be together and to talk. Um, yeah, so a lot and seconding everything that has already been said, because I think the wisdom that was just dropped by uh, my fellow panelists is so spot on. Yeah. Yes, Ashe, Ashe, mm. Abolitiousness, y'all. Love it. Love to see it. <laughs> um, all right. So that's it for the questions. I know I'm definitely going to take some time to just reflect on all of this wisdom, the passion, the commitment. Um, so grateful. Like, this is really the winning team, like for real. <laughs> like I, I feel just energized that, uh, you know, we, we have a vision of freedom that's sustainable. It includes everyone, it needs everyone. Um, and that's so deep, that's so humbling um, to be in a lineage of abolitionists um, that really, you know, our ancestors started doing this work on the slave ships and even before then. So it, it's a really deep lineage to be, to be carrying with y'all, I'm really humbled. Um, so, to, to before we go into a Q and A, um, you know, y'all are each doing such incredible work, you know, in New York, in Oakland, um, and so I would just love if y'all could briefly just give a, a quick call to action for all of those who are watching us from home. Um, how can we support your work? How can we get involved with all of the incredible transformative justice work you're holding on the ground? You know, how can we really support most impacted people? So please um, let us know how we can tap in and support your efforts. Well, I think our website is hillwithholla.com. People can contact us so that we can open up a larger conversation about who you are, who we are, and how we could build more. I think, you know, for men, male body identifying folks, is one of the things just sending, like, like just thinking about, like, like loving yourself. And I think some of that for me goes to like figuring out how you get back to like loving your moms. You know, and I think like while we love our moms as men in deep ways, I feel like a lot of our pain, and it's probably for women, and this socialization as we go out as young dudes into the street with other black women and other women, I think that's a really some of our journey that we got to go through. Um, mm, so really thinking about that. like, like how do we love ourselves, but like love our moms because the loving that moms get back to like just loving the stars, which are like black women and indigenous women. Um, so I would share that too, but yeah, hit us up in general because we got a lot of stuff going on from documentary to album, 
and it's just too much to kind of like shoot out there, but and everybody's in different places. So hit us up on our website and we we we'll follow that up. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I know I'm definitely about to be getting involved. This is just the beginning, Corey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, Oko, how about you go next? How can we get involved with the incredible work you're holding down at SE Justice and just all the amazing work you're doing? Yeah. Okay, I have a couple calls to action. So my first call to action is for people to rest. Um, mm -hmm. Your overexertion, your giving past the point of where you are bone dry is actually the opposite practice to yes. the world that we're calling in. So mm -hmm. um, check out the work of the NAP ministry and check about check out how that politicized rest is needed and you are needed because I have burnt out before and I don't want anybody to ever experience that. Mm -hmm. um, my second call to action is um, if you know a woman with an incarcerated loved ones or a gender non-conforming person with an incarcerated loved one, I encourage you to nominate them uh, to the SE Justice Group. We're going to be launching uh, virtual cohorts next year. So, you know, if you know somebody who isn't talking about their loved one who's isolated or who's incarcerated, they might be um, you know, dealing with isolation or shame from going through that process or exhaustion. Please send them towards SE Justice Group. We would love to have them in our sisterhood and community. Um, and then the third one is for you to support the BREATHE Act. Um, I have until recently been the communications co-lead for the Movement for Black Lives BREATHE Act, which is- yes. the federal policy that does everything that people have been in the streets screaming about literally for summers, decades, right? Defunds the police, dismantles ICE, reinvests um, our dollars back into our communities and, and is a practical, like written down by black women, by women of color, uh, federal policy that we intend to introduce in the first 100 days of the administration. So breatheact.org, check it out support it, let people know, right? Like protesting, all of these, we need all of the strategies and policy, you know, is another tool in our toolkit to get it done. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I would say, um, I have a few things also. Um, this past summer, I was a part of a cohort of youth abolitionists for the first abolitionist youth institute which was put on by Miriam Kaba, Project Nia, and EFA space in New York. Um, I want to plug that institute as an amazing resource for any young people who are listening now who are interested in learning more about abolition or getting more involved. Um, we have in the next month uh, or so a workbook coming out for young people learning about abolition. Um, and it is called Imagining Our Futures and we're, we're thinking sort of uh, forward thinking. My specific chapter is on abolishing the nonprofit industrial complex, uh, which is a whole other conversation. But so <laughs> the Abolitionist Youth Institute will also be taking place virtually in 2021. So if you know a young person ages 16 to 25 um, who are interested in getting involved with this work, um, learning from Mariam Kaba, from other folks of that caliber, really amazing, strong Black women. Um, yeah, that's something to check out. Personally, um, I would plug me and some of my friends, other youth uh, abolitionists got together this fall and we are coming out with a political education resource um, called Abolition Is. You can find us on Instagram at abolition underscore is. Um, on Twitter at abolition underscore is, uh, and our website is going to be abolition dash is.com. So if you want to write that down, um, yeah, and that really is to my point about getting started somewhere. I know a lot of really intelligent, wonderful young people who are thinking about abolition. Um, and we were like, let's get together and put something out. So that's going to be coming within the next month. And it is going to be uh, specifically geared towards young people as well. So once again, if you're young and anybody, everybody's young at heart, I guess, but <laughs> if you, are, uh, you consider yourself a youth abolitionist, um, please check out Abolition Is um, and the Abolition Youth Institute and keep fighting the fight. Like we said, we are on the winning team and that yes. is doing right now. So <laughs> that's it for me. Beautiful. Well, thanks y'all so much for that. Um, yeah, we have about nine minutes for questions. I just got to give a quick plug um, because 
you know, as an organizer in Detroit, we have so much amazing initiatives that y'all could tap in. Um, Detroit Safety Team is a community resource that I rely on in situations of crises and harm instead of going to the police. Um, they're doing a lot of that work about responding to violence um, and, and harm outside of the state. I also want to uplift um, Black Futures Green Light excuse me, it's Greenlight Black Futures, which is a really incredible transformative justice org on the ground that's responding to the hyper surveillance that's happening in Detroit um, through Project Greenlight. We're actually one of the most heavily surveilled cities in the nation. And it's no accident that we're also the nation's largest black majority city. Um, and then finally, um, please support our work with Led to Life. Um, you know, we're always looking to partner with folks impacted by environmental and state violence. Um, and we're really putting ceremony and ritual at the core of the work. And uh, as I see questions coming up, I'm seeing questions like, you know, what's a, what is, what is an abolitionist? And, you know, how can we dismantle the, 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 the corporations that create the prison? And a lot of these questions, unfortunately, we can't get into in nine minutes. Um, but I really want to uplift fumbling towards repair. Miriam Kaba and Shira Hassan. And also um, there's a really incredible mixtape. You know, Corey brought up just how important art is in this movement. And there's an incredible mixtape um, that came out from the Just Practice Collaborative. It's called Steps to End Prisons and Policing, a mixtape on transformative justice. And it really brings in like the OGs, mm -hmm. the most visionary people from this movement right now. It's a hundred dollars. Um, you get like 11 videos. It's so deep, everything from disability justice to how do we support survivors, um, environmental justice. I mean, it's, I have learned so, so, so much from it. So as a starting place, you know, support the organizers who are on the ground really doing this work. Again, it's called Steps to End Police, Prisons and Policing, a mixtape on transformative justice. Um, beautiful. So get into questions. Here's our first one. I love the idea of transformative justice, but what I struggle understanding is how to agree on that. I think Liz cut out just a little bit. I really wanted to hear that question too. <laughs> yeah, that question was sounding good. I can't see the question. I try to look in the chat, but I don't see the question. We'll see if we can get it back really quickly. But I do love this question of, um, you know, how can you be an abolitionist or address the corporations? Like one of the things that um, SE is working on right now is like, um, you know, the the pandemic is raging in, in uh, behind bars, right? Um, and so there are people who are responsible for the decisions and for the, the non-release of human beings, which the CDC says like, y'all need to get people out of these prisons. That's how we stop the pandemic, continuing behind bars. Um, and that there are people who are responsible for that. So like CDCR secretary, Kathleen Allison, that's somebody whose name everybody needs to know. So everybody you know be like, hey, the person responsible for that, CDCR secretary, Kathleen Allison. We gotta know her name. We gotta know her email address, her phone numbers, where she might stay at, who knows her, who can impact her decision-making, because we can press them. There are people behind these decisions and we can press those people, we can remove them, we can put them, put new people in there. Liz, hi. Sorry about <laughs> that, y'all. Technology, am I right? <laughs> um, thank you for that. I'm sure you answered it beautifully. Um, <laughs> what we uh, the <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, so this person was asking, um, when people don't agree how we transform society, then what do we do? How does transformative justice approach that? And I think this is such a great question because the reality is like no one is, you're never gonna have collective consensus, right? On like how we respond to harm. So what is y'all's advice in that scenario? I think, you know, part of transformative justice is kind of like inhaling justice. I think it's like, it's like preventative, responding and about future. So I think you're always trying to cook up a culture, cook up a culture and a soundtrack and a vibration that's like, always thinking about strategies and practices and like, you know, like what is healing first? I mean, what is what is healing and what is journey and what does it mean to journey together? And while you're doing that, I think people are always in disagreeing and like, and not sure or coming from different frameworks. I think what I've like pull on in the past, I think if you build trust, if like people have different experiences, you're just like, yo, this person really care about me. Like this person really like is seeing me. Like then people, can get past some of the differences 
um because the trust and the love like open up people's heart it ain't like people don't got to be so defensive so i would say like just like creating you know in cosmology i think and ancestors teaching i think a lot of that teach you how to build trust but i think we all got urban and real life experiences and stuff we could look in our relationships to pull on and be like oh that's how I, i'm that's who i am and that's how i show up when i'm trying to build trust i'm mm-hmm. i think thinking about that more as we before after and during like conflict you know like because it's never like when it's happening it's always thinking about how do we make more trust in the space how do we build that because we know absolutely. disagreement is coming absolutely and that that trust is so important like we don't have to all agree on the strategies of how to respond to harm and i think that the core of it is really asking the person who's been harmed what does healing look like for you what what does justice look like for you you know, for, for it was survivors who taught us that actually, you know, prison doesn't feel like justice for me. Um, so I think that's a really good place to start is by listening to the person who's been harmed. And I think another really good place to start is just, you know, we're going to agree that we're not going to have a zero tolerance approach. We're not going to have a punitive approach. We're not going to dispose of this person that is causing harm. So I think that's another good place to start. Um, so we have we have two minutes. Um, Jaden and Oko, would y'all like to, uh, yeah, would you like to, to finish us? Sure, I'll just throw out quickly um, to that question. I've disposed of the idea that we all need to agree and that's been a huge thing for me. Ooh. I like to be right. I like to be you know, the one to be like saying the thing, but um, yeah. And I think when we start thinking about addressing root causes of harm and how it feels and, and really getting interpersonal with people, um, agreement doesn't always become the most important thing in those instances. Mm. It, starts, it looks a lot more complicated when you get to the nitty gritty with another person that you don't need to necessarily agree. Um, but yeah, and then overall, thank y'all for having me here. And Liz, the reality is we don't even agree with the current system and it's still being done to us. Hello! <laughs> we don't agree! We already <laughs> don't agree with the stuff done to us. So I would rather disagree with my people rather than with y'all people. So Oof. that's well, real. That was the whole point. Talk about oh, I, I really wish that we had more time to get into some of these amazing <laughs> questions. Um, but for those of us, you know, those who didn't get to uh, have their question asked today, please reach out to us individually. Y'all, like the bios are on the Bioneers conference page website. You know, we're really looking forward to um, bringing folks more intimately involved with our work. So thank you so much to you panelists. Like y'all are so dope. Just thank like you, made my you. entire thank life you. right now. Thank like you. all the good energy. I'm just sending it to y'all. I'm so grateful to be in this struggle for, for liberation with y'all. It's so deep. So yes, so grateful. So grateful. Thank you for your time today. And thank you, Bioneers, for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you.